So it's dreams now, is it? Uh, remember that film called Chicken Run? Yes. Yeah, animated stop frame parody on the movie The Great Escape. And there's this character, Tweedy. And these, these mice scuttle around inside these ceramic gnome sort of figures. And these gnomes are scuttling along and Tweedy looks at them and says, all sorts of gnomes now. Oh, it's all in me head. It's all in me head. And then, and then you, and then it's dreams. So it's dreams now. So we're going to talk about dreams. But first of all, let us pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence in this place this day. We submit ourselves to you. And our cry, our prayer, is that you will minister by the power of your spirit. That you will draw us into a place and bring us into an alignment whereby you can release blessing and favour, prophetic direction, purpose and destiny. We give thanks to you, Lord Jesus. We take our own authority at this time and we bind every demon that would seek to find its way into our presence to undermine, to distract, to exercise in dynamics of witchcraft and all of that. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we bind you at every portal, at every entry point, and we declare that this ground that, that we are on is holy ground. It's just by accident that I've removed my shoes and I'm here in my socks, but that's just the way I feel comfortable. But I declare this is indeed holy ground, sanctified, set apart for you to release according to your will, your ministry desires. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And if you agree with that, well, uh, don't hesitate to voice it. Just getting ready. I can't go too far these days uh, without my spectacles. So you can hear me okay, everyone? Yes. Right, that's, that's great. Okay, let's just get straight into it, eh? Dreams and visions. If you look at Acts 2, 17 to 18, which is also from the book of Joel 2, 28 to 29, it says this. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men, like me, shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. These are those days. These are the days in which we can expect with open hearts that God will pour his spirit out upon us. Actually, I believe that God desires to pour out his spirit through us that we can be a blessing to others. If God is going to pour his spirit out on all flesh, he's going to use vessels worthy unto honour. He's going to use his sons and his daughters. He's going to position us to release us into our calling. And we can get very specific because of the prophetic words that have been released, even in this room this day, about commissioning, about purpose, about impacting this nation. And so here we are. So it's dreams now. There are dreams and visions. 
But I actually want to talk to you today about dreams and desires. You see, there, there are two types of dreams. Those dreams we experience when we sleep, call them night visions, call them nightmares in some cases, but those are the dreams that we have when we are not fully awake and conscious. But then, there are those dreams we have when we ponder and dwell on what might be or what could be. Some might say fantasies. I, I, I won't go there. But, but this is the thing, like, you know, you know, like, you dream home, or you, you dream holiday cruise, or you dream job. You see, when you buy a lotto ticket, not that I'm saying you should, but, but you will get the, you, you'll, you'll get the concept here. When, when you buy a lotto ticket, you're actually buying a dream. You say, with that little lotto ticket in your hand, say, so, oh, what could I do with a hundred million dollars? And then you dream. You dream about that holiday or those holiday homes or how you could bless the church, do church planting, underwrite missionaries, do all these amazing things. But that's, that, but that's the other type of dreaming. Dreaming based on desire. And, and when things have been hard and the ground is dry, we tend to lose our passion and our desires in God and there's discontent and there's despair, and there's a sense of hopelessness, and faith dissipates. But where we stimulate and irrigate desires within our hearts, then, then our spirits become alive again. It's a question, isn't it, of where we align these desires, and for what purpose? and for what motive and all of that. So, two types of dreams. Night visions, or when we're asleep dreams, or, or the desires. And, and these two types of dreams can either be natural in the realm of the soul, not necessarily bad, you know, but just in the natural. And then there are those supernatural dreams, the, the revelations we receive when we're asleep, or those impressions, or those uh, uh, anointings we feel when we're awake that stimulate us in all of that. You know, Job 33.15 says, For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering in their beds, and the incessant snoring rattles the curtains and, and uh, pushes the drawers in and then pulls them out again on the next suck or blow of air, you know. Then God opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. Or to put it another way, I guess, God brings and embeds into the spirit of his sons and daughters revelations, cues, keys, and all that. Are you with me so far? Yeah, good? There are these dreams that God places in our hearts that are desires aligned with his own heart. And you know that scripture in Psalm 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And we, and we go, oh, well, I just delight in you, Lord, and this is what I'd like. And then out comes the list. <laughs> Prayer list. No. Uh, I delight in you, so these are my desires. And we get this one wrong, don't we? We do. 
We think that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us what our hearts desire, but it's not so, I just said that. What it really means is that when we delight ourselves in the Lord and come into alignment with his will and his passion and his desires, then he will place those desires into our spirits and they will illuminate within us. And, and so in Scripture, there are a number of places where uh, God indicates righteous desires. You know, there's, there's 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. Uh, so, uh, what is it? If you desire to be a minister, you desire a good thing. Minister, office, whatever, but, but ministry is, is, is not about office or title anyway. It's about function and it's about effect. And I could go off on another whole sort of diversion, but I won't. See, there's another one, which is um, uh, speaking of prophecy, and you have uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and it outlines the gifts of the Spirit. There are the, the nine of them, you know, uh, faith, healing, miracles, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, uh, uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues, discerning of spirits. I think I've missed one in there, but, but they're all in that passage in 1 Corinthians 12. And then, and then in Scripture, the focus shifts from giftings to 1 Corinthians 13. Oh, the chapter of love. The, the, the wedding scripture favourite. Though I speak with the tongues of angels and of men and have not love, then clang, 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 all of that. That, that, whole, that whole chapter is, is really about the fruit of the Spirit and character as opposed to gift. And, 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 and of course it finishes about uh, seeing in the glass darkly or uh, reflecting on a tarnished surface or, or, or whatever you like. And, and so uh, it then shifts in 1 Corinthians 14 back to the giftings again. And uh, there's a special emphasis on protocols regarding prophecy and so, so forth. But it, but it actually says this... Uh, I haven't even got it written down. Uh, uh, it says that uh, uh, I, I would have you desire the gifts, yeah. but especially to prophesy. Words that affect, I, I, I forget the exact phrasing, but, but that's, that's what it is. And so um, there's nothing wrong with desires as long as they are aligned with God. The thing about dreams, just shifting gear now, they are such a topic of interest, of culture, and of spiritual significance, as we've even covered. In music culture, there are so many songs that speak of dreams. Can you think of any? <laughs> I haven't got that on my list, but that's one. But there's Les Miserables, or if you're from Tasmania, Parramatta, or New Zealand, Les Miserables. <laughs> and it says, I dreamed a dream in time gone by, when hope was high and life worth living, something like that. Dream. I dreamed that love would never die. I prayed that God would be forgiving. Not a bad dream, not a bad song. Then there's the monkeys. Remember the monkeys? <laughs> Cheer up, sleepy Jean. Oh, what can it mean to a daydream believer and a homecoming queen? I'm, I'm doing this to sort of uh, get you attuned to, to, to dreams uh, all around us in God and in culture in every walk of life. I've got a whole lot more. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all. There's Dreamer by... Who said that? Dreamer by Supertramp. Dreamer. You know... Okay. Uh, 
Who remembers the Everly Brothers? You got it? Dream, 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 dream. Okay. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Or you rhythmics. Sweet dreams are made of this. And then there's one of my favourites, Man from La Mancha. To dream the impossible dream. To fight the unbeatable foe. To strive when your arms are too weary. To run where the brave dare not go. To right the unrightable wrong. To love pure and chaste from afar. To strive when your arms are too weary. To reach the unreachable star. <laughs> this is my quest to follow that. And so it goes on. <laughs> dream. Yeah, dream these things. Dream things in God. That's what I'm saying. Hilary Duff said, what, what dreams are made of this? Anyway. But let's shift again. That's pop culture. Let's go a bit deeper. The, the phenomena of dream is embedded in Australian indigenous culture. You know about the dream time. I looked it up. It says the dream time is the period in which life was created according to Aboriginal culture. It's called different names in different languages. And when I was little, uh, about 30 years ago, oh. 40, <laughs> 45, do I have a, do I have a, uh, a higher bid? 45, 45, 45. Uh, they're the old grainy black and white TVs. And there are these programs. I was in New Zealand. There are these programs. And one was called The Adventures of the Sea Spray. It's an amazing uh, uh, TV series about a schooner that sailed the South Seas. And, and, and another one was Skippy. Skippy the bush kangaroo. And, and, and then there's this one, The Magic Boomerang. And the magic boomerang was a boomerang, if you remember, I'm sure you do, if, if you remember. <laughs> uh, and, and time would stand still when the boomerang was thrown, except for the person who threw it. And, and, and that was something that was uh, uh, deep and meaningful about dream time. And speaking of Australian culture, there's the movie... The castle, or should, the castle. You know, oh, this one's going straight to the pool room, you know. Or, tell him he's dreaming, you know. Dream comes up everywhere. He's, dr he's dreaming. So, so, what am I saying here? Dreams, they're considered a way of envisioning or, it's, or experiencing the spirit realm in just about every non-secular faith or belief system, not least Christianity. So let's just uh, dwell on scripture and all the way through scripture there are situations and examples of dreaming and dreamers. There's Jacob and he had that dream. Joseph was a dreamer. Pharaoh had a dream which Joseph interpreted. Gideon was informed about a dream in the book of Judges. We know about Daniel, his dreams, which are as powerful and as uh, relevant and as aligned with the book of Revelation in the Bible as, as any other book could be. Daniel is the revelation of the Old Testament. Job, I mentioned Job earlier. Joseph and Mary, the warnings to... Uh, get out of Dodge, <laughs> move down to Egypt. The wife of Pontius Pilate 
had a dream at the time of the Passover and the crucifixion. Then there's Paul in uh, Acts chapter 16. He had this desire. He was up in the, the, the northwest corner of Turkey, Asia Minor, whatever you want to call it, and he wanted to head east towards Bithynia, and all the doors were, were closed, and so he had a little nap, and a man in a dream visited him from Macedonia, and as a result of uh, responding to that dream, Europe opened up. Europe is a, a special place for me and Sharon, and, and we were so blessed a couple of weeks ago when, when David MacDonald uh, prophesied over us about uh, returning to Europe. We've had that on our hearts for, for 12 or 15 years, and, and in particular Portugal. I'd even just say in regards to that, uh, this is not about angels or angelic visitation, but uh, about four years ago, we, in prayer, were having visitation from the angel of Portugal. And this took place over about an eight-month period. And we've got about 15 typewritten pages of the interactions we had with the angel of Porto and of Portugal and of the keys that we are to... Uh, und the tasks that we are to undertake and the, the things we are to do uh, an intercession when we go there. So, so that, that was really special for us. But, but God's spoken to me and Sharon, and I know many of you as well, in dreams. Um, you, you're talking about the dream and the tornado and all of that. There was, there was a, a while ago, I was, I was asleep, and yet the, this dream I had was so real, so vivid, that, that maybe I was awake in a, a dream state, but, but, I, was, but I, was, I was there in a location. And I looked up, and it was a cobalt blue clear sky. Not a cloud, it was just like blue. And, and, and as I looked up, uh, I, I saw three dots. And as my eyes sort of looked to focus on that, it was good it was in a spiritual state because I, I, I don't have uh, uh, that sharp vision anymore, uh, optically speaking. And as I looked up, I could see that these dots were actually circling eagles. And, 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 and as I sort of made eye contact, one of the eagles saw me and returned eye contact and came down. And, and this eagle came down and morphed into an angel. And uh, 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 he said, do you know uh, who I am or what I am? I said, oh, you're an angel of revelation. Duh. <laughs> he said, yes, but I'm more than that. He said, I'm also an angel of disclosure. And, and what he then did was he, he took me under his wing or he, he concealed me like I was in an, in an invisibility cloak or something like that. And he took me into a public area and I could see everything that was going on and nothing could see me because I was being concealed. And, and, and he said to me, I'm the angel of disclosure. I'm going to conceal those things that are to be concealed, and I'm going to disclose and reveal those things that need to be exposed. And I know he was speaking governmentally and uh, 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 sort of um, uh, in terms of politics and commerce and, and all of those things. And so uh, let's see how that continues to unfold. But uh, I, I believe that God is doing things in these days and he's going to uh, lift up the valleys and bring down the mountains and invert orders as effectively as coming to a table and tipping it over in the temple. 
which many think, ah, oh, that's chaos. No, it's restoring chaos to order and all of that. Do you want to share some of your dreams? <laughs> that did not have a question mark on the end. <laughs> Give me a chance for a water break. So this all okay so far? Because yes. we're going to get into some deep stuff soon. Okay. Um, right. Uh, one of I, I think probably the the first encounter that I had with the angelic was actually through a dream. So the context was that we were actually house-sitting for someone and we were out in the back of beyond. Um, but our kids were living on the Gold Coast and they were going to a church um, in Reedy Creek. And what we would do is we would, because we were out sort of the back beyond, we would come every so often, we would come uh, and catch up with them. So we'd take in the church service and then we'd have lunch with them and then we'd go home. And um, one night I'm sort of um, asleep and then I have this very vivid dream which it was a combo of seeing things in the spirit but then also being told stuff by the Holy Spirit. So in this dream, and it was so, so clear that, you know, if I was an artist I could actually draw, but I'm not. <laughs> um, but... In the dream, I was in the auditorium of this church, and there was the stage. And then on the left-hand side of the stage was this huge angel, all dressed in gold and had, um, had a gold trumpet, but was dressed with like a purple sash and a purple cape. And on the other side of the auditorium was another angel, and, and this angel was all in silver with a silver trumpet and he had like this royal blue sash and cape. And then I sort of got this download from the Holy Spirit and he said, the angel in the gold and purple is an angel of praise. And the angel on the other side in silver and blue is an angel of worship. And he said, I'm positioning them in this church for a season because I'm going to release um, new sounds of worship. Um, and then he proceeded to tell me about the pastor that was the worship pastor at the time. And he gave me this download for this pastor. So that, that was the dream. And so I thought, now, and this sort of talks about protocols with prophecy. Um, so that church didn't really know me at all. And I didn't feel comfortable about waltzing up the next Sunday to the worship pastor and say, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, now what am I going to do with this? So I spoke to my daughter, who's a very wise lady, um, whether she recognises it or not. Um, and so I said to her, look, this is what's happened. What do I do with this? Because they don't know me from any, you know, anybody. And she said, oh, mum, <clears throat> you should write it out. And then she said, when you come to church, she said, I'll actually introduce you to the worship pastor and you can give him the word. And she said, I'll tell him the context. So the following Sunday, we go to church and I'd, in, the, in the week, I had typed it all out. Two hour drive, <coughs> two or three hour drive. Yeah, it's about a two or three hour drive to get there. So I get there and after the service, <coughs> she takes me over to the worship pastor and introduces me and I just explain the situation and that and I handed him the word. And the word was <clears throat> about the fact that God was going to position these angels for a season in the church and going to release new sounds of worship um, that, that was going to be quite a, a very strong creative anointing being released in that church where they would actually produce themselves new songs. And so I sort of I gave him the paper and he actually decided that he'd, there and then, he'd open it up and he'd read it, which he did. And he said to me, oh, he said, thank you very much. He said, this is the fifth prophetic word that I've had 
about this and he said, I now know that I know that I know that I'm meant to do this and, and that God has provided for me um, the platform, if you like, for me to do this. And like the next time we went to that church, you know, the pastor was up the front preaching away and the next minute he says to the worship guy, oh, make me a song about Isaiah 61. <laughs> and this worship pastor's at the piano and he just has this, obviously his download, just plays this new song based around the words, words of Isaiah 61. And now that music team, of which our son actually was a part of at that time, they and our daughter-in-law, um, they went on to actually produce their own CD. And um, they were, had um, songwriting anointing and that. And, and that was used to bless many other ministries too with their, um, their worship and that. So that's the power of dreams um, that can be given to you um, to, you know, bless somebody else, help them um, to see the pathway ahead. But I believe that we're actually in a season where God is going to give you guys, um, like um, that, in terms of strategies, particularly for prophetic intercession and strategic prayer. I, I firmly believe that. Um, sometimes God has woken me up in the night and asked me to pray um, for areas, um, and I don't really know, so I put, most of the time I pray in tongues, um, but I believe that that's something that may happen as well, but God will give you also insight and revelation into the prayer strategies that you need. And, and Logan was talking about um, the angel of, of Portugal and that, so... Um, when they would visit, when, when the angelic would come, you know, you'd get a download from the Holy Spirit and we actually wrote notes, but they would give us the strategies, where to go, um, what you need, what to do, all of that thing. It was very specific. And I believe that this is a season for you guys. It's going to be very specific that God is going to give you those strategies. And it may come, and so that, what I experienced was a dream, but it also had that vision aspect to it. But it, it, you can get those strategies can come as dreams or as visionary experiences. Um, I won't go into it, but there's, there's different kinds of visions that you can have. But I'll pass it over. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there are uh, uh, many other examples, but uh, uh, time to press on and in. So where are we here? There's a, there's a type of dream that God can anoint that shifts a nation that shifts a generation, that actually impacts a century. Martin Luther King Jr. It says in the research I did for this uh, that I have a dream, it's a public speech that was delivered by Baptist Minister Martin Luther King Jr. Junior. During the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom on August the 28th, 1963, 6, 40, 70 years ago. In this speech, King called for civil and e economic rights and an end to racism in the United States. It's a clarion call against racism everywhere. It was delivered to 250,000 civil rights supporters from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. The speech was one of the most famous moments of the civil rights movement and, the most, and among the most iconic speeches in American history. You know how it goes. It says, I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit 
down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will be judged, not by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. He said, he said, I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right down in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little boys little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. It says, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Uh, he had a dream for his nation. I have a dream for this nation. And that's why it's relevant. We can draw upon expressions of shift that can bring about change on an incredible scale. If there's ever a, a passage of scripture that applies to Australia, it's Psalm 63 verses 1 and 2. O oh God, you are my God, early will I seek you, maybe between 12 and 3 a.m. <laughs> my soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. We're talking about spirit. We know it can rain here, don't we? How's Christmas, everyone? And he says, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. This is where it now shifts to us and to here. So I have a dream that one day there will be such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on this dry and thirsty land that this nation would be transformed, that righteousness and justice would prevail and that evildoers and the principalities they are in league with will be disclosed, disempowered, and destroyed. I have a dream that one day in Australia and New Zealand will re-establish the bond of Anzac mateship and be the carriers of revival to the world from the ends of the earth. Even as it says in Isaiah 41 verse 9, I'll come to that in a minute. Even back to Israel, just as our forefathers did in Gallipoli and Palestine in World War I, the way would be seen in the eyes of God, that we would be seen in the eyes of God as sheep nations. protected from snakes. Isaiah 41 verse 9 says this, You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, You are my servant. We are his servants. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. In Acts 1.8, just to contrast with that, we have the activation of the Great Commission to the ends of the earth. You know, but you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. In, this is in the upper room, remember, just before Pentecost. You will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So in Isaiah 41, we have from the ends of the earth. 
I have a dream that we would be positioned as Anzac nations, as the church, the ecclesia, and individually, to recognise and honour the Messiah when he returns, to be wholly aligned with him, to be effective in fulfilling the Great Commission. You know, the Great Commission is restated in various uh, sort of uh, angles towards the end of each of the Gospels, and it's restated again, of course, in the, the first chapter of the book of Acts. Just to remind you, in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all, na all the nations, of all people groups, whether abroad or in urban enclaves in this country. Make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That great commission in, in, in Matthew is actually, it's an apostolic call. It's the call of government rule. And it differs, in a sense, to Mark 16 where it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The one who has believed and has been baptised will be saved, but the one who has not believed will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. <coughs> they will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents. A lot of practice in Australia for that. So they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, uh, energy drinks, uh, whatever, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And this Great Commission is framed as a prophetic call, the call to function in a supernatural capacity, working in signs and wonders and miracles. It's the same Great Commission, but one is balancing with an apostolic emphasis, the other with a prophetic emphasis. As you know in Ephesians 2.20, that uh, uh, the church is founded upon apostles and prophets, not pastors and deacons. They're part of the five. Well, the pastors are part of the five. I'm not going to go there. But what I'm saying is that the apostolic and the prophetic working in conjunction, uh, yoked in common purpose, can bring about incredible change and fulfil the desire that God has for this place, this earth, this planet, this world. And so, here we are. We live in days in which God is choosing to release greater anointing and greater glory upon his church to prepare us for his return. Even now, look, we're, we're coming up to Passover. It's not that far away, the feast season of Passover. But, but I'm reminded of a prophetic word that I brought in a Feast of Tabernacles conference that we took in Perth uh, in September 2022. And, and there were prophetic words released over on that coast, which I have never released here on this coast. And so this is the time. And if you watch The Mandalorian, mm -hmm. this is the way. There's this. When, when God places on our hearts a word for a nation, declared as a dream, like he did with Martin Luther King, and when he prophetically anoints these dreams, we can then speak them into the realm of the Spirit as prophecy. This is the prophetic word I gave for this nation and for the south lands of the Holy Spirit, but, but first, a little background. Uh, you know about the feasts. There are the seven feasts of the Lord, and they occur in the year uh, in three groupings. There's the, the feast season of Passover. That includes uh, uh, unleavened bread and first fruits. 
And Jesus fulfilled that 2,000 years ago by becoming the Passover lamb, by descending into hell and taking uh, captive, captivity captive, and he rose again first fruit. So, so Passover is all about Jesus. And, and then we have, uh, 50 days later, Pentecost. Pentecost in the Old Testament was where Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. And so this concept of what uh, Pentecost was about shifted radically on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. And that was the Holy Spirit. So we have in God's redemptive plan for the world that spans history, we've had uh, the first four of these seven feasts fulfilled literally. And so we, we now await the fulfilment of the last three. I could go far more into that, but I won't. If you've got a handle on it, that just provides a point of reference. So this is what I said uh, in Perth. I believe the three remaining feasts on God's calendar to be literally outworked on the timeline will involve three great moves of God climaxing in the return of the king. This is the day. These are the days. Feast of Trumpets. I believe that there is about to unfold a great prophetic movement that will flow from this region and will announce the return of Christ. It will challenge the establishment politically and ideologically. And it will challenge the church globally. I believe this move will challenge the outmoded and ineffective type of church that separates clergy and laity, rooted in elitism and exclusivity and entitlement. This move of the Holy Spirit will challenge the insecure church that suppresses the apostolic and the prophetic. It will challenge the faithless church that denies the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of holy angels. It will challenge the entitled church by exposing hypocrisy and prosperity doctrine. And it will challenge politicians and activists by confronting them fearlessly and exposing their antichrist agendas. It will challenge secularists by operating in signs and wonders and miracles, refuting flawed science and enraging woke socialist liberals. No! Oh, yeah. It will challenge the foundations of the world as we know it. That is the fulfilment of the Feast of Trumpets. And that's going to lead into the fulfilment of the Day of Atonement. I believe this amazing prophetic movement will not just be in and of itself. It, it, it opens the gates to something even more profound and deeper moving, in a, moving in a deeper way. It will, the prophetic movement will result in waves of repentance for sins and evil works on an individual and national scale, unprecedented in history. There will be healings and forgiveness and reconciliations and restorations between families and loved ones, tribes, racial groups, and ethnic people groups, nations involving slavery, colonialism, genocide, persecution, war. You could go on and on and on. This prophetic movement will lead in 
to the Day of Atonement, resulting in waves of repentance and renouncement for sins and evil works on an individual and national scale, unprecedented in history. This is the way. This has to be the way. If the church globally is to fulfil the Great Commission, which it says it must do in Matthew 24, 14, the, the, the gospel will be preached to the whole world and to every nation and tongue and people group, and then the end, then the return of Christ. And so this great move of repentance, trumpets, Yom Kippur Day of Atonement, this great move of repentance will provide the platform for the global revival and harvest of souls. And this is what Tabernacles is about. It's in gathering. I believe that Tabernacles will be marked by the great end times revival and harvest of souls. Millions will come into the kingdom. The great tribulation will coincide with the harvest because we have the polarisation of good and evil and the conflict that will result because of it. The glory of the Lord will be manifest on an unprecedented scale and the demons will hate it, precious. It will precede the return of the king who will preside from Zion for a thousand years. And this seventh feast will bring completion to God's plan to redeem creation. So I share these prophecies not only to release them into the realm of the spirit here on the east coast as it was released there on the west coast, but, but so that you would dare to dream them for yourselves and take a hold of them and embed them in your spirits and then regurgitate, rearticulate, revoice them so they echo and resound and rebound in the realm of the spirit. Align with them and embrace them. Declare and prophesy them to shift the spiritual atmosphere over this nation and this region because this nation and this region, the south lands of the Holy Spirit, are destined to be the carriers of the banners of revival to the world. Pray them into fulfilment. Declare and prophesy them to shift the spiritual atmosphere and look to the future, not to the past. It's all ahead of us. Pentecost was for yesteryear. We live in the reflected glory of the cross. We are about to enter into the radiant uh, experience of the glory itself. And so I finish here. Isaiah 43, verses 18 to 20, in regards to looking ahead. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert in this dry and thirsty land. The beast of the field will honour me the jackals and the ostriches, or in my uh, uh, ANV, uh, Australian National Version, um, dingoes and emus. Because he says, I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. And so I just finish with this one last scripture. But I'm personalising it. And I'm releasing that for you to receive and embed and cultivate into harvest. 
And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And you, my sons and my daughters, shall prophesy. You, young men, shall see visions. You, old men, like us three in this room today, we shall dream dreams. And on you, my men servants, and on you, my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and you shall prophesy. God bless you all. Amen. Sure. Footnote. So who gets the last word in around here? Who do you think? <laughs> now, I just want to encourage you, because I believe this is a strategic time for open heaven, and he's brought this message, download from the Holy Spirit, about dreams, and I believe that God wants to speak to you guys in dreams and visions. So I would encourage you, if you don't do all this already, when you, when you go to bed at night, before you go to bed, um, positioning, Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I just submit my, as, as my physical body goes to sleep, um, I open my soul, my spirit to you to receive, to hear from you. And that's part of positioning. And you're, you're saying to the Lord, I'm open. I'm open to hear from you. Whatever you want to say to me, whether it be in a dream, whether it be in a vision, whether it be a word that's a down low, whether you wake me up, at midnight or three, and you give me a download, um, I'm positioning myself, Lord. I'm available to you. And trust me, you do that, and God will respond. So, little challenge there.